I'm Katie Edwards. I'm a postdoc fellow in the Brain Injury Unit here at the NINR. I'll be talking to you today about my education and research background, my research focus, uh, what I do here at NINR, um, and some about my future plans. So this is a brief overview of my education and research path. Um, I have bachelor's degrees in biology and nursing, and I recently completed my PhD in healthcare genetics. My path to a research career came from my experience as a neurotrauma intensive care nurse, where I became especially interested in traumatic brain injuries and why patients with similar injuries would have such vastly different outcomes. Thus, my graduate work has focused on proteomic and genomic biomarkers following brain injuries. Currently, I'm expanding my research as a postdoc into further exploring how these biomarkers map to imaging findings as well as neurological outcomes following concussion using ultra-sensitive blood tests. I finished my PhD in healthcare genetics at Clemson University School of Nursing in South Carolina. The program was interdisciplinary, so it enrolled not only uh, nurses, but also a variety of students from different healthcare backgrounds. Um, this was important because it expanded our viewpoint and how genetics can play into various aspects of healthcare from a multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, during that time, I had opportunities to develop teaching and research skills during my graduate assistantship appointments, um, as well as develop leadership skills through my participation in the Jonas Nurse Leader Scholar Program. One of my favorite aspects of the program was the lab, in which I worked with cell culture models of breast cancer and built on skills learned during my biology degree. My lab and research assistant positions focused on genetic variations in breast cancer and was valuable for me to solidify my desire to pursue research. However, I could not forget the brain injury patients that I had cared for, and this drove my desire to pursue TBI research. Thus, I completed my three years of coursework at Clemson and then came to the NINR to work in the Brain Injury Unit with Dr. Jessica Gill to complete my dissertation work through the Graduate Partnerships Program. During my experience in the GPP program, I focused on concussion, specifically in military populations. Concussion is a worldwide issue affecting all age groups, genders, and races. Every year, about 42 million people across the world suffer from a concussion. This is about six in every 1,000 people. Just a few months ago, the FDA approved the first blood-based screening tool for concussion. This is promising for continued research, yet despite this global health issue, there are still no FDA-approved therapies specific for concussion. More specifically, among members of the military, approximately one out of every five individuals serving overseas since 2000 has experienced a concussion. The vast majority of these concussions are caused by blast exposures. Sources of blast exposures can include improvised explosive devices, also called IEDs, rocket-propelled grenades, hand grenades, aircraft explosives, bombs, missiles, and cannons. In total, over 312 individuals worldwide have experienced a concussion during military service. The Brain Injury Unit uses the NINR symptom science model to guide our research. Our lab focuses on biomarkers of traumatic brain injury, including gene expression, microRNA, proteins such as inflammatory cytokines, and neuronal specific proteins such as amyloid precursor protein and tau, which are also associated with Alzheimer's disease. Our protein work uses ultra-sensitive technology, similar to measuring grains of sand in a swimming pool. This allows us to detect even slight changes in protein concentrations. Specifically, my dissertation focused on peripheral biomarkers of inflammation following blast exposure in military populations, which I will briefly cover the results in the next couple of slides. These were the two major aims of my dissertation work. I looked at two different populations. The first population was a military training environment in which I looked at gene expression, and the second was a combat environment in which I looked at cytokine changes. The second population was a deployed military cohort in which we observed significantly elevated levels of the inflammatory protein IL-6 
in the first 24 hours of blast exposures. For the gene expression study, we found dysregulated gene expression, including the structure, function, and development pathway shown here on the slide. And we'll look closer um, at this pathway on the next slide. This shows findings after blast exposure of altered gene expression, some of which are related to inflammatory pathways and ultimately levels of cytokine expression. So I'm going to focus on the three genes in the middle of this pathway, TRIP12, NAE1, and AKT1, on the next slide. These genes relate to the inflammatory response. First, genes related to ubiquitination were increased in activity. Protein ubiquitination initiates the removal of oxidized or misfolded proteins following injury, and its processes protect neurons from reactive oxidative <coughs> species that accumulate following injuries, um, such as blast exposure, which has been seen in preclinical models as well. One of these genes that was upregulated was TRIP12, which encodes for a protein that tags other proteins for destruction. These findings support previous findings of increased UCHL1 following repeated level low blast exposure. A downregulated gene was NAE1, which is a protein associated with the nutilation pathway, which is similar to ubiquitination. Nutilation is also a critical regulator of dendritic spine development, which sends, receives, and stores neurotransmitters in the brain. The downregulation observed in this population suggests that blast exposure hinders the nutilation pathway. Nutilation also downregulates inflammatory pathways, thus inhibiting this pathway may lead to activation of pro-inflammatory pathways. Finally, AKT1 is a hub in this network that includes about 14 connections and is known to regulate a vast number of cellular processes including the inflammatory response. AKT1 is an upstream activator of pro-inflammatory pathways. Interestingly, in this same population, we have also observed elevated levels of IL-6 and TNF-alpha. Upregulation of AKT1 in this sample suggests activation of these pro-inflammatory pathways. These pathways are essential to initiate secondary injury mechanisms required for neuronal recovery. However, if activity of this pathway is too high or too long-lasting, it can actually be detrimental to neuronal recovery. Thus, the inflammatory response after brain injury results in biological changes that are interrelated, including those of the proteins in addition to gene activity that we just discussed. Inflammatory proteins, or cytokines, can help us better understand the biological underpinnings which shape onset of symptoms following recovery from TBI, and can also so serve as a source of, for a point-of-care test. Cytokines are small proteins released by immune cells that function in mediating the inflammatory response following injuries such as TBI. They are generally categorized as pro-inflammatory, such as TNF-alpha or IL-6, or anti-inflammatory, such as IL-10. The anti-inflammatory cytokines shift the balance toward those neuroregenerative and neuroprotective biological pathways, while pro-inflammatory cytokines shift the balance toward apoptosis and cell death. Cytokines are a well-documented research area in preclinical and some clinical TBI studies, especially more severe populations, and have been proposed as a therapeutic target following brain injury. The results of this study um, showed that at the less than eight hour time point, IL-6 was significantly higher in the concussed group as compared to the healthy control group. This level decreased and was not significant at the 24 hour time point, however the mean change between those two time points was also significant. This is the first study to demonstrate peripheral biomarker changes in a deployed military population with high rates of blast exposures. More studies are needed to map these biomarker changes more specifically to recovery processes and symptomology, including imaging findings, for example, in, additional, in addition to more TBI populations. We have seen that inflammatory gene activity and cytokines are associated with concussion in military populations. Next, I'm going to talk to you about some of our current research in a civilian population. 
Although CT scans are the current standard of care for patients, MRIs are actually able to better detect more subtle injuries, such as those um, in concussions. However, MRI is not always readily available for patients. Thus, blood-based biomarkers are a possible alternative to consider for concussion diagnosis and prognosis. For this study, we examined cytokines TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-10, as well as VEGF within the week following concussion. This population consisted of over 340 men and women ages 18 to 96. This prospective parent study collects blood at five time points following a concussion diagnosis. For this study, we're specifically looking at the inflammatory cytokines at the first two time points, which are highlighted on the slide, 24 hours post-injury as well as seven days post-injury. And how these cytokines correlate with neuroimaging subgroups. All of these patients have a concussion diagnosis, and we want to know if these cytokine levels correlate with CT positive, MRI positive, or no imaging findings, or negative controls. Race and ethnicity were not significant between the groups. The study enrolled both males and females. The mean age for our population was 46 years old. Since age was significant between the groups, we did control for that in our analyses. So IL-10 was not found to be significant between the three groups at baseline or at follow-up, which is consistent with other clinical studies of acute brain injuries. These figures demonstrate that TNF-alpha was found to be significant at both baseline and follow-up between the CT-positive and MRI-positive groups, as well as between the CT-positive and negative controls. IL-6 was also significantly different between the imaging groups. Significant differences were observed between the CT-positive and negative control groups, and IL-6 at baseline distinguished between the MRI-positive and the negative control groups. VEGF was also significantly different between imaging groups. Significant differences were observed between the CT positive and negative control groups, and also distinguished again between the MRI positive and the CT positive groups at both baseline and follow-up. So after considering that inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, VEGF, and IL-6 are significantly different between imaging groups, next we wanted to know if these biomarkers can predict which imaging group the patients would belong to. So this figure demonstrates the sensitivity of these cytokines to predict imaging group. We conducted an area under the curve analysis to determine the ability of baseline cytokine levels to predict imaging group. VEGF and IL-6 show promising and will be explored in further work. So in summary, our preliminary findings show that inflammatory cytokines, such as IL-6 and VEGF, may be useful in differentiating positive from negative neuroimaging findings. This line is, of work is important because we know that MRI is not always readily available for concussion diagnosis. Overall, these findings suggest that inflammatory activation consistent with other clinical TBI studies. The brain and the spinal cord are traditionally believed to be immune privileged. However, recent work has shown that the CNS contains lymphatic vessels. This is termed the lymphatic system, which has spurred research into the immune functioning of the central nervous system. However, the role of elevated IL-6, VEGF, and other cytokines may have in this brain's lymphatic system remain to be studied. Finally, a deeper analysis of this data is warranted and will include items such as relevant health histories, as well as chronic biomarker levels and associations with patient outcomes. So we have seen that pro-inflammatory cytokines and inflammatory gene expression pathways may be dysregulated following concussion. My postdoc will further explore the relationships of these biomarkers to post-concussive neurologic conditions and symptomology specifically in populations such as military veterans. This is important because we know that approximately 10% of those with concussion will go on to experience post-concussive symptoms, including those summarized on this slide. Detection of protein or gene expression changes, for example, can yield insight into effective biological pathways, 
and pave the way for further understanding of underlying biological processes and the <coughs> symptoms that may result. So my immediate plans for the future um, include completing this postdoctoral fellowship here at the NINR over the next couple of years. I've highlighted some of my goals for the postdoc experience as they relate to the symptom science model. I will be focusing especially on how patient outcomes associate with biomarkers, gain some more big data analysis experience, as well as an industry perspective and the process of validating a biomarker tool for future clinical use. As for my future research plans, this includes building a foundation of research utilizing genetic and proteomic biomarker discovery and analysis to further the field of traumatic brain injury research, ultimately contributing to improving symptoms and outcomes for patients. So all of this work is a team effort, so I'd like to acknowledge all of our lab members here at the NINR, as well as our military collaborators and my dissertation committee at Clemson. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you all today.